Right, good morning everybody and uh, good morning, good afternoon wherever you are. Welcome to this uh, third webinar for Open Access Australasia for 2021. Many thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Ginny Barber, I'm the Director of Open Access Australasia. Um, we're a membership organisation, we're supported by 20 universities in Australia, eight in New Zealand and we have affiliate members, Creative Commons Australia, Toa Toa in New Zealand and new affiliate members, Alia, Wikimedia and the Australian Digital Alliance. Um, so welcome to everybody who's joining today. Um, just some practicalities, we've had more than 170 people register, so highly delighted to um, see the high interest in this topic for, in this region. So just some basic housekeeping as usual. Uh, so we will record this webinar and uh, it will be posted on the website with the slides afterwards. Um, so please just bear that in mind. Um, as usual, please keep your microphone muted. Uh, we'd Preferably keep your, your um, video off as well because that helps just with bandwidth for people that are not on fantastic bandwidth um, uh, uh, connections. Uh, if you type your questions into the chat, I'll read them out um, and talk with Fiona at the end of that time and we will finish on or just before the hour. So before we begin the, web, begin the webinar, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners across Australia. Um, the Turrbal and Yugara people are the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on uh, in Brisbane today in southeast Queensland. UNSW is the Open Access Australasia's host institution and it's located on Bedigal and Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation in the Sydney Basin. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and to extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here today. So I'm really delighted to say that our speaker today is Fiona Bradley, Director of Research Services uh, and, at, uh, um, and Corporate at UNSW in the, in the library there. At UNSW, Fiona leads the design and delivery of scholarly communications, open access repositories and reporting and the institutional infrastructure that underpin these services. In infrastructure, I think, is my favourite topic when we talk about open access. So I'm um, really delighted to have Fiona Kind of in, as an expert in that. Before that, joining UNSW, Fiona was Deputy Executive Director at Research Libraries UK and previously held senior management roles at, the, at IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, the peak global body representing libraries, so a really important organisation. And in those roles, she designed and delivered capacity building in more than 80 countries, advocated for access to information in the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in collaboration with library organisations and NGOs worldwide. So this is this is very much her world and I'm really delighted we've managed to get her to speak to us today. So I'll hand over to Fiona to share her screen um, and uh, we'll talk to everybody at the end of her talk. Thank you, Jeannie. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the welcome. Hopefully this will do the right thing. OK, is that looking good? Perfect. All right, thank you very much. Um, so let me just get the videos out of the way. Here we go. All right, so thank you so much for the welcome. I would also like to acknowledge the medical people who are the traditional owners of the land where I'm joining you from. I'm also in Sydney um, and in this particular part of Sydney and pay my respect to their elders past and present. So in September 2015, after more than three years of negotiations, the member states of the United Nations adopted the UN 2030 Agenda. The agenda is an inclusive, integrated framework of 17 sustainable development goals which span economic, environmental and social development. They lay out a plan for all countries uh, to actively engage in making our world better for its people and for the planet. The UN 2030 Agenda is a political commitment, which means that everyone, including libraries and civil society and um, private sector as well, have a role in making sure that all countries meet the goals and leave no one behind. So in this talk today, I want to briefly take you back to the origin story of how the goals were developed and what they represent. This is really important to understand how we can work with the goals and where open access fits in. I'll also go over some of the ways that progress towards the goals is being measured, and then I'll turn to some of the tools that you can use to show how your library and open access contribute to the goals. So let's get started. 
So the SDGs are one part of the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which helps UN member states really focus their attention on poverty eradication, climate change, and the development of all people. So the outcomes are not legally binding. However, the monitoring and follow-up process is taken very seriously and includes both thematic and voluntary national reviews every year as part of the UN high-level political forum. So there are two things I want you to keep in mind throughout this presentation. Everybody or well, most people now know about the SDGs, but Agenda 2030 is more than the SDGs. And the reason why that's important, I'll come to in a couple of minutes. And the purpose of the SDGs and the purpose of Agenda 2030 is for UN member states to achieve the goals. And that's also important to keep a focus on, um, as I'll go into later. So I wanted to just walk through a little bit of the backstory about where this came from, because this helps to set the context for what the UN is really trying to achieve. So before the SDGs were the Millennium Development Goals that ended in 2015, success in achieving the MDGs was very mixed. Um, some progress in some areas and not so good in others. As the UN neared the end of the MDG process, various conferences and documents began to lay the groundwork to negotiate the next process. Starting in 2012, this part became known as the post-2015 process. So you often see a lot of documents around that talk about post-2015. From the outset, the post-2015 process was intended to be much more inclusive than the NDGs, which were very top down. Um, it, it's probably a little bit apocryphal, but, but um, there were a lot of stories about essentially one person at the very end of the NDGs sitting in a room in, in the office, writing them out, and that's how they came to be. SDGs were very different. What this meant was that civil society would be able to play a much bigger role than ever before in advocacy and helping to shape the new agenda. So over the three years between 2012 to 2015, this was an extremely intensive and political process. So libraries got involved very early on. IFLA took the lead in this work as they have consultative status with ECOSOC, which is the Economic and um, Social Committee, which means that they are allowed to register to participate in UN meetings as part of the civil society delegations. So this work was largely led by just a couple of staff at IFLA in close collaboration with the board and two of the US um, based governing board members at that time were able to attend all the UN meetings in New York. So, um, I'm able to share a little bit of this origin story with you because um, before I came to UNSW, I was one of those staff members. And my job was to respond to consultations, prepare briefings for ministers, build coalitions with other NGOs, train librarians to respond in their own countries and write a lot of advocacy toolkits. Um, and I also got my turn to attend sessions at UN in New York. This was my um, view at one of the meetings um, and a number of other conferences with stakeholders and ministers over um, that period of time. It was a huge amount of work, but a lot of fun too, to be honest, um, uh, if you're into this sort of thing. So why did libraries get involved so early? Um, to do all this work. So past experience had shown um, that the process matters. So the way uh, these processes work, documents and positions are built up over many, many iterations and a long period of time. So if we wanted our issues to be part of the agenda at the end, libraries needed to have a seat at the table from the start. So the other reason is that the um, intention with the 2030 agenda was to have some influence in shaping where governments allocate their attention and resources. And so this was a really huge opportunity to build the case to invest in access to information. So coming to the end of all of this advocacy after all these years, um, there were three key achievements in the 2030 agenda that are useful for open access as well in different ways. So firstly, universal literacy was recognised in the vision 
for the agenda. So I mentioned earlier that the 2030 agenda is more than the SDGs. So the very first part of the document, if you go and have a look at it, also includes this outline of a vision of the world in 2030. So this was a really great surprise because this was something um, that we had asked for and it was amazing to open up the final text and see this uh, language there. Secondly, um, in collaboration with um, a lot of other stakeholders and partners um, and um, talking to a lot of member state representatives, access to information was recognised in the SDGs themselves. Um, this is target 1610 that gets referred to a lot, which is about ensuring public access to information and protecting fundamental freedoms. And third, um, with the support of library colleagues and a lot of other stakeholders in a few very key countries, um, the inclusion of the indicator, which is 16102, which is about the number of countries that adopt and implement constitutional, statutory and all policy guarantees for public access to information, which is very technical, um, but quite important. The indicators matter because these are what help track progress towards meeting the goals. You know, it's, it's that whole thing about what gets measured is what matters. So apart from access to information issues, um, there was a lot of advocacy from um, libraries and others to support targets around things like access to the internet, ICTs and culture, both of which in turn also contribute to open access because without access to the internet, you can't access anything online. Without culture, you cannot recognise the value of local and multilingual knowledge. So you probably already know the 17 SDGs address issues like land, water, poverty, education, industry. Some of these are not particularly controversial. Others are. Um, as you can imagine, the goal on peace and justice, which is where we find access to information, was really very challenging for member states to agree on. And there was a period of time where this entire goal was at risk of being dropped from the whole framework. So that's how um, political these issues can be. Um, the language about public access to information itself changed multiple times. And an additional challenge in terms of advocacy is that many civil society organisations define access to information only in the very specific context of right to information laws or freedom of information um, to government. But it's really critical to us as um, um, library people, as open access advocates, that it really also consider access more broadly. Um, and so it was quite a big success to have it adopted in, in this form. So you might have noticed, hmm, there's a lot here about information, there's a lot about public access, literacy, that sort of thing. Some words are not included anywhere in these statements. So nowhere are there any words specifically about libraries or open access. And that's really, it's, it's a compromise because in a process as high level and consensus driven as this, you have to really identify the language that will get other stakeholders on board. It's also really necessary to get on board other players in civil society with big voices, um, the other NGOs, media organisations, rights activists, um, before you can even start making that case to governments. And then the key in turn is to be able to use your new coalitions to advocate for the specifics of what you want to achieve. Stepping back from this, this sort of framing and language and how access to information is used sits within a much larger human rights based context. So there are many NGOs and campaigners who for decades have worked on issues like freedom of expression, access to information, and have argued that access to information is, is fundamental to democracy and underpins the achievement of all other human rights. So you can really hear echoes of that approach when we talk about things like access to information and open access underpinning the achievement of all the other SDGs. So that's nearly enough about the background and what the SDGs mean. Um, and because we're talking about open access here, I'll talk to now specifically what this all means. So while the 2030 agenda does not include the phrase open access specifically, there's an obvious 
fierce connection um, to those targets in SDGs. Public access to information through means such as open access helps people to exercise their civil and political rights, to be economically active, to learn new skills, to enrich their cultural identity, and to take part in decision making. These are all things that were uh, called for in um, the Leon Declaration. However, as I mentioned before, the 2030 Agenda is also broader than the SDGs and includes um, discussion about a range of related issues such as monitoring, financing and partnerships to support the goals. So in other words, who's going to pay for it and how will we know when the goals have been met? The UN recognised that research and data are very critical to this understanding um, and back in 2015 had recommended the development of an open access knowledge platform to bring together the scientific knowledge that underpins the SDGs. So this was something um, uh, we saw early on, IFLA welcomed the recommendation at the time and it's very encouraging that this platform is now under development and harvests research from existing open access repositories, as well as the World Bank and other UN agencies. And what this demonstrates, I think, is very high level global recognition of the value of open access in helping to meet global challenges. I mean, I think this also, um, this example highlights that although most people are most um, familiar with the SDGs, um, and have a sense of what those about, that's the part of the agenda people know best. All parts of the agenda and all the different related processes are relevant too. I mean, I would not have expected open access um, platforms to show up in a discussion that came out of Addis Ababa about financing the SDGs. So since the SDGs were adopted, We've also seen some fantastic strides in open access and open science in intergovernmental agencies, many of whom have now adopted open access policies and licenses for their own outputs. The huge growth in new data platforms and also the development of the draft recommendation on open science at UNESCO. I mean, for, um, for this level of work, that's incredible progress in what has really been actually quite a short period of time. So that's the background to the process of what was achieved in 2015, some of the high level achievements since that time. So we're now five years in and less than a decade ago until 2030. So what else has been achieved? Um, so the monitoring process is a really critical part of identifying whether the member states are on track to meet the goals. So stepping back a little bit from the SDGs more broadly, Indicators, data are a really critical way that civil society can hold governments to account for progress on any number of issues. So for example, in the human rights space, access to information, there are numerous reports that track progress on issues such as um, press freedom, access to the internet, regime types and so on. Uh, you may have seen um, reports about uh, things like freedom in the world, which is produced by Freedom House in the US, of press freedom index statistics and these sort of things. There's also official data that's compiled by intergovernmental organisations themselves coming from official statistics. Um, for example, the ITU tracks mobile phone and internet access and the World Bank keeps a track of governance indicators. So while it might seem that we are absolutely awash in research reports and open data from everywhere, at the start of the SDGs and still today, the UN is extremely concerned that many countries still lack the ability to provide data on basic information. I'm talking very basic information such as um, up to a third of births in the world are not able to be properly registered in many countries. And so that type of very basic gap in data and capacity means it is very difficult to identify who needs what services in a country. So this is a very acute problem. So this is why monitoring and data has become such an important pro, uh, part of the process. So without data, we cannot really understand whether we're making any progress. 
Different UN agencies are responsible for monitoring the 232 indicators in the SDGs, and these come together at the annual UN high-level political forum. So knowing that one of the main activities of um, many organisations in civil society is producing reports and data, that's exactly what many have done for the SDGs to help complement official statistics and reports. So for example, uh, I helped to establish the Development and Access to Information Report, the DA2I. And then there are also many other groups that are contributing directly to the official monitoring processes, which are called voluntary national reviews and thematic reviews. Everyone can make a contribution to sharing your story about how open access makes a difference. So, for example, Alia, Lianza, Call have all been very active in this topic on behalf of libraries in Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand. This advocacy has really paid off with libraries recognised in Australia's first national voluntary review. And it was also a people's review in New Zealand where libraries were a big part of it. Um, further to that, groups of countries report back on their progress every year. IFLA recently analysed the voluntary national reviews submitted to date and found that nearly half of those presented in 2021 mentioned libraries or information. This shows how possible it is to make impact at a high level and how critical it is that if you are working on um, SDG stories to make sure that you share them. Your stories could be big or local, but it's the impact that matters. For example, stories about open access might look at how access to research helped identify existing treatments that would be useful for COVID-19 or make more visible neglected tropical diseases that lack sufficient funding and attention. You could be looking at how open access support student startups or how a researcher at your institution was able to make much more impact with their work than ever before. Your stories could be about the difference your whole library makes or the impact of one researcher or one discovery on the lives of others. So back in 2015, I would sometimes hear access to information had been totally solved, not a problem anymore because everybody has a phone and lots of countries have right to information laws. But as librarians, we know that the digital divide, gaps in literacy skills exist in every library, community and country. Since 2015, we've seen the rise of misinformation and disinformation as key concerns in elections and around the pandemic. Open access and rapid access to scientific outputs from preprints right the way through to publish articles and data have become a key means of ensuring that people have access to facts and quality information. So at the local level, using their stories, using their data, libraries globally have embraced the goals and embraced them into their work, which is incredibly rewarding considering um, all the work that happened to get to this point. Much of this work has involved mapping stories and showing how open access and access to information underpin each of the goals in different communities. So this is a wonderful way to raise awareness about the roles of the goals in each of our daily lives. Many universities have also adopted strategies around grand challenges and are also undertaking research that supports the SDGs. So this is another way to make a contribution. But if you're doing that at the local level, I would also strongly encourage you to go further and share these stories with CORE, CONSOL, ALIA, Nianza, and IFLA. It's absolutely critical to have these stories and data to contribute uh, to the civil society story, to the library story, as the official monitoring process continues. I mean, I think this is important to remember too, because it's important, as I said earlier, to keep a focus on what are the SDGs for? In addition to official data and reports, contributions from civil society in relation to open access and research, we've seen that all of the major bibliographic tools have mapped research in their indexes to the goals. Combining this with open access filters, this can be useful to get a sense of how uh, a country or an institution, how their outputs are mapping to the goals. It's a little bit like an alternative to um, the fields of research codes in a way. Um, and it can also be useful to identify resources to, to learn more about different aspects of the SDGs. 
this is all, all good and useful. However, there are some other activities that perhaps aren't quite hitting the mark and that potentially divert attention away from more meaningful activities. So for example, Times Higher Education's impact rankings, the only global performance table that assesses universities against the SDGs. But in my opinion, I think the ranking is a little bit of a missed opportunity to show just how much universities are contributing to open access research and their communities, because this is not contributing to official monitoring. Goal 16, for example, would have been a perfect opportunity to um, look at data around open access, but it's not present there. Also looking at innovation, one of the key measures is, is uh, patents that cite university research. I mean, that might've been another place to talk about open access. The goal on, of, on no poverty counts co-authorship with researchers in low income countries. Again, that might've been another place to talk about the benefits of open access. The closest thing in the Times Higher Education ranking is probably under the Sustainable Cities and Communities Goals, which has an indicator about public access to libraries. And you get a, a point if you um, are able to provide um, free access, but the way in that access is um, provided is not defined more than that. So again, what are the SDGs for? They're not there to um, rank our institutions about how we're doing, but they are designed to ensure that no one is left behind and that governments meet their commitments by investing in policies and services that make a difference in people's lives and that support the planet. Research and open access has an essential contribution to that, but it's important to make sure it's the energy is going in the right direction. So with all of that said, how is open access actually tracking in the agenda? So there's data collected by UNESCO, which is the custodian for the access to information data. We can look at third party data, such as the various open access rates um, achieved by institutions over the last few years. For example, you could use something like the Leiden ranking and the various bibliographic databases. Um, and there's also been the subsequent development of, of instruments like the UNESCO draft recommendation on open science, which demonstrates high level commitment and interest um, amongst governments and UNESCO to these issues. And there are a range of other um, data sources available. Um, in addition to that, um, there are numerous reports coming out now. Each year, a narrative report comments on progress towards the goals. And as you can see here, there's been some progress in these sorts of related areas around right to information, um, access to data, but there are still significant challenges and gaps. So for example, um, the latest report commenting on data has specifically noted the contributions of civil society, the private sector and academia, but that there are still many gaps left to fill. So notwithstanding the necessity for data, there's um, been a sense that the level of investment has kind of started to flatline a little bit. Um, and the UN notes that um, the enabling capacity and support required um, in different countries has not risen accordingly, unfortunately. And this is even in the face of um, all the challenges around the need for data to meet the challenges of the pandemic. And if you really want to get technical, there are also a number of um, databases where you can get right into all of the indicators themselves to get a sense of progress. And um, if you are more of a dashboard type person, there's also the UN Stats progress charts, which has a series of dials that give you a sense of how things are going. So unfortunately, not every indicator is reported on um, every year. As I mentioned, there's more than 200 of them. But I think you'll get a sense of the challenges involved in all of these issues from this year's report on goal 16, the peace and justice goal, to see the overall the picture is very mixed. So unfortunately, in some areas, while things are going well, in others, things are, are not. So press freedom, internet access, for example, are just some of the challenges still being faced in many countries. And it's important to remember also and put things in perspective to remember that over half the world is still not connected to the internet. So that's what's happening at the global monitoring level. 
and also some inspiration about how you can use StorySeek to get involved. So if you are interested in doing more to look at how to measure your contribution and the contribution of open access to the SDGs, where should you start? So I think one other thing just to keep in mind is I've summarised uh, sort of a, a huge political process here um, that's very um, complex, but I think one thing just to keep in mind is that the relative importance, not only of the, um, the SDGs, but also the various goals does vary widely in different countries. And, and even amongst looking at our institutional level, um, our universities and institutions are all doing different things in this space. So I've, I have frequently described the SDGs as really just one tool in your toolkit of different um, ways that you advocate to others that might be some, uh, in some cases, more relevant than others. It really depends on who you're speaking to. So if you are wanting to get involved some resources, so I mentioned before, you, you can use storytelling approaches, you can gather data from all sorts of different sources to make the case about access to information, libraries and open access. So there's a huge amount of information available now but you could start just by looking at your own library's plans and objectives. And there are a couple of libraries that have already mapped their work in this way. You can look at your institution's strategic plan, particularly if they talk about global challenges or the SDGs. You, you can look at the resources from Alia, Leanza, Call and Consul. Um, there are a range of um, sustainable development university guides. And then also um, IFLA has numerous resources on this. So the report on the left was, was our first effort at mapping stories to the goals. And this has been um, repeated in a lot of different countries and updated over time by others, which is absolutely fantastic as new examples um, and stories come to light. And this has also been expanded through um, training materials and, and storytelling manuals and things like that to make it as easy as possible to do this work. So I'd like to um, finish here by, by just really encouraging you to get um, engaged with the process to learn more about the SDGs and also some of these other activities that are coming through now, such as the UNESCO draft recommendation, so that we can all collectively really keep the pressure on to make the most of opportunities at every level, locally, nationally and globally to show the difference libraries information and open access makes. So as librarians, we live the SDGs every day. We innovate, we educate, we support sustainability, equity. So for us, the SDGs are not just a report card. They are really at the heart of everything that we do. But it's up to us now to tell others about it. So thank you. Great, thank you very much, Fiona. That was a fantastic talk, a really inspiring, actually. And I, I think a bit like you, I'm, I'm, I definitely am a bit of a nerd about um, the kind of the process for these types of things. They are incredibly exciting to be part of, and you know, especially when, as for this, it feels like there's been a huge, um, huge, huge advance as, as part of the process. I was very struck by you said that the process matters. Um, I thought that was a, a, a very telling quote, actually. Um, so I'll give people a chance to put some questions in the chat, but I'll, I'll just kick off with a few if that's all right. Um, do you, I want to just talk a bit about the process of how this happened. What do you think were the key allies for libraries in, in this whole process? How, and how did you go about, I guess, identifying those allies? Were they people in, or organisations in place beforehand or was that sort of something that happened during the process itself? So it's a really good question because there was um, quite a big mix and, and in part some of the um, organisations that we worked with very closely that we got to know um, had come about because um, at that time libraries were also and still are very active at forums like um, WIPO advocating for copyright reform and there's a similar sort of network of groups that are involved there. And then also um, through the WISIS and Internet Governance Forum um, sort of network. So uh, 
then you'd start to go to all of these um, uh, funny conferences that were sort of related, like open government partnership, and you'd start to see sort of some of those people and then a whole other um, sort of network again that lean much more into issues like transparency and accountability and those sorts of issues. Um, so sort of by um, spending a lot of time talking to each of these um, groups, you get a sense of what their interests are, what they know about um, our issues, how much they're interested in kind of collaborating to make something bigger. So the main um, uh, sort of, I guess, partners, coalition, allies, um, that we ended up working with um, most closely were people working on issues like um, uh, uh, open media, um, uh, journalism, um, Article 19, which is a really well-known um, NGO that works specifically on uh, freedom of information issues. Um, and then uh, we became uh, very much involved with a new group that had um, several hundred NGOs involved, which was about transparency, accountability and participation and joined their board to really um, drive that forward a little bit. Um, and that was much bigger. Again, that, that brought in all these sorts of groups like Amnesty and so on. Um, but it's, it's really interesting because uh, you sort of, uh, you know, it's funny to think about things that happen in sort of pre-corona times because a lot of it was really just running around to all sorts of random meetings wherever you could get access, wherever you could show up and really just sitting in small discussions and breakout rooms with all different kinds of organisations in a way trying to make friends and just explain, well, here's why libraries are here and here's what we do and here's how we can help each other yeah and and to what extent have those alliances continued um are they still i mean i know you're not sort of a ifla anymore but do you think those they have persisted or did they was it a particular time that um they came together for do you think um a number of them have persisted so for example the tap group which is probably the the key um coordinating group for um everybody who's kind of working on goal 16 issues that's still very much a, a prominent group and IFLA is um, part of that um, some of the others come and go but that's the nature of these things it really depends on what you're working on at that time um, but um, and, and certainly it's very interesting sort of looking back at then how that feeds back into other issues going back to copyright, you know, bringing some of those people back into um, other discussions. It's really intriguing just how these uh, groups move around. And um, yeah, some coalitions are, I guess, like friendships, you know, because some coalitions are absolutely very stable. They kind of um, have a very long life and others are by necessity, uh, short for a very time limited purpose and they, they don't persist. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Great, thank you. Um, so there's a few questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll try and summarise them. So one from uh, Jerry uh, Corvisanos. So it's around the, it's quite a specific one around the one of the indicators around public access. So, um, so first off, is Australia listed as one of the countries that have adopted public access? And perhaps you might want to talk about the, the, you know, the, the association between public access and open access more generally. Yeah, so this is this um, challenge in terms of really trying to communicate uh, that um, access is more than that which um, governments are required to give public access to by legislation. So, for example, in Australia, um, I had a look the other day at um, Australia's latest report on this indicator, and um, you know, you know, the Australian position paraphrasing is, is generally that, you know, we have um, legislation in this area, therefore, you know, it's it's been achieved, um, it's goal solved. But that, um, in terms of the position that libraries took in this process in, in thinking much more broadly about access, um, you know, we wouldn't say it's a really goal achieved until we are looking at, at some of those broader connected issues around open access access to research or um, public access to the internet um, and things like that. So, you know, in pretty much every country, there's still a, a fair bit of work to do in this area. But again, it comes back to how does each um, country in turn, you know, sort of take these global 
um, targets, take the global indicators, and, and in a way they kind of get rewritten for slightly different purposes in every different context because it's, it's looking at what's most relevant um, in different regions. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really great point, actually, that is that you know, there's latitude to, um, to, to interpret them as appropriate, and that's really important. But then I think that comes down to the issue of needing, you know, to continue the advocacy at the local level to make sure that that level of detail is actually um, brought into discussions at your country level. Um, okay, so uh, Keely Chapman's got a question about, about plans for post-2030 goals. What, is, what are your thoughts on that? Oh gosh, you know, I was thinking um, yesterday, it probably isn't all that far away before people start thinking about this. So much like um, the discussions really took off, you know, about 2012 uh, for 2015. Um, I think we might see something similar start to emerge in a couple of years. But the problem is also, I mean, it comes back um, to all the, the huge things that have kind of happened since 2015. It's actually been quite a, um, a, a difficult time for the world if you think about it all the things that have happened um, in the last couple of years you know whether that um, prompts earlier thinking or whether that kind of postpones that, that discussion uh, a little bit I'm not really sure so it'll be one I think you know really staying tuned um, for those who have um, contacts in this area just to get a sense of of what's going on and, and where those discussions start to spring up Great. So, um, just I had a. I just wanted to kind of dig a bit into the question about that you talked about the stories that we tell to um, to promote the SDGs, and I guess in advocacy more generally, I think often we think that you know the data is what matters. But do, I, I wonder if you just expand on the idea of the stories and whether you feel like we miss it. We often miss. <clears throat> we're not doing that enough as as perhaps advocates in our area. Yeah, I mean, I think it's been really um, intriguing to see this dual focus in terms of, of the high level reporting is, is clearly very much emphasising both the, a very strong narrative as well as the data. So if you look at things like um, go in and have a look at the, um, you know, like the Australian New Zealand National Voluntary Reviews, a lot of them are kind of quite um, story based, you know, in this community, we introduced uh, this particular service and it had this outcome. And so I think that's really opened the door um, for all of us um, as advocates and everyone in every sector that's involved in this in some way to use um, the same approach that it really is about communicating um, the difference that these goals and the difference that the work that we do makes in people's lives rather than just saying, you know, yes, okay, this many thousands of articles are available and things like that. It's much more about, well, by making this information available, for example, someone was able to do text and data mining and they found that there was already some kind of treatment that would be really helpful, you know, so on and so on like that. So um, I think that's also, um, I think, a bit less intimidating at times as well because it can be easier to... Um, identify a really compelling story rather than going out and having to do some massive survey to gather the data that would otherwise show um, the same thing. And that comes back to the UN really getting really concerned about data gaps because it's not just about measuring things at one level in a country. Trying to break that down, disaggregate that information to different genders, different communities, different areas within the country. Like it's really expensive and it's really, really hard. So stories are a great way to kind of meet in the middle. I guess they're also a great way of, I mean, some, you know, politicians, for example, often will respond to a story when they might not respond to data and such like. You have to know your audience, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, so a question from Amanda Lawrence about um, how did you manage the confusion about what we're talking about when we talk about information. So obviously there's a whole, many things included within that. Um, and I guess this also comes back to this idea about how, how coalitions align to um, sort of uh, around a particular definition of information. So everything from research publications through to, um, you know, media, et cetera. Was that, how, 
was that something that, I'm sure that came up in discussions how, how did you manage that um so one of the the key things I've found in these sorts of advocacy um, processes and in others is that you kind of end up saying the exact same thing until you're so sick of the sound of, of your own voice saying the same thing over and over and over. but it's the only way you have to be absolutely clear what it is that you're saying and doing and be consistent with that so one of the tools um that uh, you know that many many organisations use that we all, or that when I was at IFLA we also found very useful is um, that was one of the rationales for the Leon Declaration that came out in 2014 was to come up with very clear language that the community could agree on um, that outlined how access to information intersected with all of these other issues around um, skills, around capacity, around um, public access, open access, all that sort of stuff, and have it there in one document and then get, uh, I think, in the end, 600 other organisations signed on to that to be able to say, this is what we mean. So whenever there was confusion, you can have something to go back to. This is what we mean. Um, at the same time, I think one of the most memorable um, statements I think I've ever heard in any forum um, is uh, there's a really large um, NGO in New York, Civicus, which is sort of like a civil society monitoring body. And the CEO of um, that organisation, who had been around, I think, a lot of these processes for a very long time, was like, what you also have to remember is you know what you want, you know what the documents say. At the end of the day, the SDGs can mean whatever you want. So you, you use these things to achieve what you want to achieve. You know, so, so it's that sort of um, process as well, which is very interesting. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And I've heard I've heard that said that you know you can have, for example, a not very great law, but you can interpret it as you think works best and not to get too hung up about the, the details of specific wording. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's good advice. Um, so just, uh, I'm really interested about the open access knowledge platform that's under development. I wondered, could you just perhaps expand on that a little bit more? And um, I think also that's something we'd probably want to know a bit more about and if there's an opportunity to participate in it. Um, so it's like I say, it was one of those weird things that popped up in the um, financing for development outcomes document. Uh, it was just, you know, you, you go through all these things and oh, okay, what's this about? Um, and um, essentially, it looks like having had a only a fairly quick look at it is that is that it's essentially like a super aggregator pulling together all of the, the UN um, data and document systems together with things like open air. So it's making use of all of these existing um, national, regional um, open access aggregators, but obviously with more of focus specifically on the type of research that's supporting um, the SDGs. So I remember having conversations with um, a couple of people that were more, more involved in the development of it a couple of years ago, um, but as often happens, these kind of things, they just sort of spring up from some other random group. And the other thing I think is really interesting is that they're actually not using the language of an open access platform. It's called a technical facilitation mechanism. And this is the other thing that, that does make it quite hard to engage with some of this stuff, unless you really are, you know, as I was years ago spending, you know, huge amounts of time on it, trying to pass out this very weird technical language and approach, you know, to try and understand, oh, that's the bit that's open access, right? Oh, that, that thing. Um, so I think that is something that can make it a little bit difficult to um, engage with just because they're not using the same language as us. They're from a, um, you know, they're from an intergovernmental agency uh, perspective. They're not, you know, sitting in research institutions. But in terms of getting involved, you know, I think if if open air is there in, in the middle, 
as being one of the key sources feeding into this sort of platforms. I think for me, you know, thinking about the, the role I have now, looking at the repositories we have at UNSW, for me, it just makes it even more compelling and key to ensure that our content is being picked up by all of those resources. So in turn, it's flowing through to those systems. So I think that's a, you know, a good thing for repository managers here to have a look at, is just making sure that um, all your, your research is discoverable. Yeah, it comes back again to these issues of metadata and, you know, interoperability and such like that is so important. Mm. Um, okay, so a question about um, uh, equity and open access. So um, uh, this is a, a great question. So achieving open access requires someone to pay for the cost of publication. In, and we know in many low and middle income countries, paying to publish in high impact journals is not an option. So how do we achieve global equity and open access with the publication industry that was developed primarily to serve high income countries. And I guess there'll be other areas of the SDGs that that would apply to too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is sort of where um, uh, tools like the UNESCO draft recommendation are really helpful because there is quite a lot of um, discussion in those sorts of documents around um, the, the whole publishing system as it were. But I think just really, um, it's important to keep in mind and communicate. Um, so I've kind of um, done a slice through in this presentation and only just talked about the Australia New Zealand perspective. But of course, you know, very much all of these sorts of discussions were taking place at the time with colleagues in um, a range of different um, economic and cultural contexts. And absolutely um, the sort of low middle income country groups. So there are different groups at the UN, um, depending on their economic status. Um, a lot of this was discussed at that time. And I think it's really important to keep in mind things like um, the developments around platforms for um, um, diamond journals. I mean, looking, for example, at um, South Africa is extremely strong in the sort of diamond landscape, uh, uh, the regional platforms that we know in Latin America. But also remember, if you look at the, the um, Directive of Open Access Journals, and like it's still somewhere around 70% of open access journals don't charge an article processing charge. So we know that it's really only um, a subset of publishing that is sort of moving towards a paid model. There is a diversity of approaches. Um, so hopefully, you know, all of that together um, really makes a case for um, a publishing system that's um, equitable, that's diverse, that recognises that um, different countries and different regions and different disciplines um, all will have their own way of achieving open access. Um, I might just mention also um, at the IFLA level, um, uh, uh, we've been collaborating on um, updating the IFLA open access statement, which is now about 10 years old, of course needs a little bit of an update. And that will also be done with reference to issues such as um, uh, intellectual freedom, and the, um, the broader context of the SDGs. So hopefully having a range of tools um, to talk about uh, the equity issue um, will be helpful. Yeah, and uh, just I'll just tag on to that to say that this one of this, this year's theme for Open Access Week again is around equity and open building and open knowledge. So it's kind of, it is absolutely up there at the top of uh, discussions. Um, I'll just ask one last question. This is quite a specific one, but I curious to know whether there's an answer to it. So do we have a, a mark field to just to capture research by uh, um, SDG by each? Would that be possible? I mean, is that a, a feasible thing to do? I'm thinking particularly, but universities might want to be doing that for their own research. I've got to be honest, I don't know, but I like this idea, to be honest, I think that'd be quite handy. So we, we do know um, the um, I just see a comment in the chat there, Lucy. Lucy, so some of my favourite librarians are the activists who write to the Library of Congress more or less on a weekly basis asking for new subject headings and things like that. Like that that's how they um, spend their, their weekends. And I just think that's wonderful. So that does mean... Um, I think that there is an opportunity if there are enough people interested in, in advocating for changes in our own systems, absolutely, you can do it. Um, more broadly, um, 
I briefly mentioned all the bibliometric um, databases have kind of added these mappings in. Um, it is tricky, of course, because, um, you know, dig into the details enough um, and you can see that, again, it's this process of, of mapping some subjects doesn't quite work neatly and um, some topics are kind of getting dropped. But it does mean, I think, at least, you know, there is a lot of interest in um, how to discover uh, things according to different themes and, and map them to different goals and targets and that sort of thing, um, which can be handy. Right. And I've just seen that Prue has, Prue Mitchell has put something in about uh, data for the SDG a ta a taxonomy for that. Um, so I'm going to bring this, bring this to a close. Um, thank you very much, um, Fiona. That was a fantastic talk. I think really inspirational, actually. And I love the way that we're all kind of getting um, dug into the details now about how to actually, you know, how we might track this and, and follow it up. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, I really look forward to perhaps hearing you in a couple of years' time, seeing how we're tracking with this over the next uh, couple of years. Thanks very much.